Κύριε Σιτηλίδη, σας καλωσορίζουμε στην Ελλάδα. Μπορείτε να μας πείτε, να μας μιλήσετε για τον εαυτό σας, από πού κατάγεστε, ποιος είστε και τι δουλειά κάνετε στη Μάσιγκτον. Πρώτα απ' όλα, χαίρομαι πολύ για αυτή την πρόσκληση, Σάβα, και χαίρομαι που είμαι εδώ μαζί σου και με τους ακροβατές σας. Είμαι πόντιος εγώ. Ο πατέρας μου, του πατέρα μου η οικογένεια ήρθε με, μετά τη μεγάλη καταστροφή, με την ανταλλαγή το 22 και ε, έχουμε εμεί ρίζε τώρα σε ένα χωριό ωραίο, Αγία Κυριακή, στην Κασοριά, από τον πατέρα μου το Σόι και τη μάνα μου που ήταν και μικρασιά τη και από τη Θράκη, ε, σε ένα χωριό στην Κοζάνη, σε ένα Κοζάνη που λέγεται Πεπονιά. Και παντρευτήκαν οι γονεί μου και ε, ε, αρχίσανε μια οικογένεια στην Νιου ε, Τζέρζι και στη Νέα Υόρκη. Εγώ είμαι ο πρώτο Αμερικανό σε όλη μα την οικογένεια. Υπερήφανο Αμερικανό, υπερήφανο Πόντιο, Έλληνα και Ορθόδοξο Χριστιανό. Και τώρα εγώ έχω ιδιωτική εταιρεία στην Ουάσιγκτον. Ασχολώ και με εσωτερικά θέματα. Συμβουλεύω εγώ μεγάλου ηγέτε από ορισμένε βιομηχανικέ εταιρείε στι Ηνωμένε Πολιτείε. Και ασχολούμαι και με την εξωτερική πολιτική τη Αμερική. Συμβουλεύω εγώ α, τους διπλωμάτες α, από το Υπουργείο Εξωτερικών, το State Department, που α, ε, έρχονται εδώ στην Ελλάδα, στην Κύπρο και στην Τουρκία. Και τώρα τα τελευταία περίπου 5-6 χρόνια έχουμε αρχίσει και καινούριο πρόγραμμα, ιδιωτικό πρόγραμμα στην εταιρεία μου, που συμβουλεύομαι α, ας πούμε τις μεγάλες τράπεζες και εταιρείε και οργανώσεις της ΗΠΑ για γεωπολιτικό κίνδυνο γύρω τον κόσμο, με όλα που έχουν αλλάξει, ας πούμε, μετά το 2012, ας πούμε, με τον Xi Jinping, που έγινε ο ηγέτης της Κίνας Συν. και με του Πούτιν της πράξης α, στην Ουκραίνη και στη Γεωργία. Και τα πράγματα γύρω τον κόσμο, όπως έχουμε δει και ειδικά τώρα με τον πόλεμο στην Ουκραίνη, είναι α, σοβαρό ενδιαφέρον για ηγέτες και στην κυβέρνηση της Αμερικής, αλλά και τις, τις ιδιωτικές εταιρείε και τράπεζες και τα λοιπά της Ηνωμένων Πολιτειών. Αλλά α, αυτή η επίσκεψη εδώ είναι μεγάλη μου χαρά γιατί δυστυχώς έχω πολλά χρόνια να κατεβώ στην Ελλάδα και είμαι εδώ για πολύ λίγες ημέρες γιατί είχα τη χαρά να πάω στο Άγιον Όρος για τέσσερι Βοήθει, ημέρες. Ναι, και θα ανταμώσω τα παιδιά μου που είναι εδώ για τρίτη φορά στην Ελλάδα να τη χαρούν και ε, με το καλό θα έρχονται ε, σύντομα. Ωραία. Ε, πέστε μου σας παρακαλώ, ε, ενώ είναι γνωστό ότι στις Ηνωμένες Πολιτείες της Αμερικής κατοικεί ένας πολύ μεγάλος αριθμός Ελλήνων. Πρώτης δεν υπάρχει, δεύτερης, τρίτης, τέταρτης και πέμπτης γενιάς. Από το 1900 άρχισαν mm. και από τον Πόντο πριν την καταστροφή υπήρχαν άνθρωποι που εγκαταστήθηκαν στις Ηνωμένες Πολιτείες της Αμερικής. Για πολλά χρόνια ενώ οι Αχέπανς όταν ε, ιδρύθηκαν ήταν μια πολύ ισχυρή οργάνωση. Στη συνέχεια είδαμε ότι έχασε αυτή τη δύναμή της και οι, ελληνικοί, οι ελληνικές κοινότητες στις Ηνωμένες Πολιτείες Αμερικής δεν είχαν επιρροή στην εξωτερική πολιτική των Ηνωμένων Πολιτείων της Αμερικής. Τα τελευταία χρόνια όμως βλέπουμε μία άνθηση. Βλέπουμε δηλαδή πιο ενεργούς τους Έλληνες των Ηνωμένων Πολιτείων της Αμερικής. Βλέπουμε και θετικά αποτελέσματα όπως για παράδειγμα η, ο αποκλεισμό της Τουρκίας από το πρόγραμμα των F-35 αλλά και η πρόσφατη εκστρατεία που γίνεται για τα F-16. Τι συνέβη, τι άλλαξε αυτά τα χρόνια και έχουμε αυτή την ποιοτική αλλαγή. Mm. Πολύ σημαντική ερώτηση, αλλά θα με επιτρέψετε να σας απαντήσω στα αγγλέζικα, να τα εκφράσω με, με, λε, με λεπτομέρειες. Yeah. So, the HEPA was founded as a social organization in a very difficult period in United States history where there was great discrimination against Greek immigrants. Because of our Orthodox faith, uh, especially the fundamentalist Protestants in the South viewed the Greek Orthodox as basically the brothers or the cousins of Roman Catholics who were also discriminated against after blacks and Jews in the South. And so the Ahepa was founded in Atlanta, Georgia in 1922 and they're celebrating their 100-year anniversary as a social organization to help Greek immigrants be able to assimilate in American society, to protect one another, to provide services, and to help end discrimination in the South and across the United States. Mm. 
So their primary mission is a social organization, not a foreign policy organization. And really until the invasion of Cyprus, there was no great need for Greek Americans to become involved in foreign policy issues because there was no major issue that was facing the Greek American community until the 1974 invasion. So that was a, a new mobilization period. It was the end of the junta here in Greece. Yes. It was the, res the restoration of democracy. But the Greek American community formed new organizations to deal specifically with foreign policy. So there were two major organizations that were founded, Savas. One is the American Hellenic Institute that was founded by Eugene Rossides, who was an assistant uh, secretary of the Treasury in the Nixon White House and a very prominent international trade lawyer. And he founded this organization to focus on the rule of law and to make sure that the United States government followed its own laws because the government of Turkey had used weapons that were supposed to be meant for defensive purposes in the event of a war with the Soviet Union during the Cold War and used those weapons for the invasion of Cyprus. Yeah. And so that was really the impetus for the creation of the American Hellenic Institute. At the same time, Archbishop Iakovos, who was then the head of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of North and South America, the entire Western Hemisphere. Today, it's very different. Our Archbishop today has only the United States, not Canada, not Central America, not, not Latin America, not Mexico. And so the Archbishop then founded another organization called UHAC, the United Hellenic American Congress. And it was modeled on the Jewish American organizations that were very effective on Israel foreign policy out of Washington. These two groups are really the main focus of Greek American involvement in trying to influence foreign policy. The AHEPA had the largest network of members and played a very supportive role and was still the best known organization at that time in 1974 and 1975. But as other issues came into the mix after the Cyprus invasion, we had the arms embargo on Turkey. We had the 710 ratio of USA to Greece and Turkey. We had a number of other issues that materialized, especially in the 1990s with the EMEA Kardec uh, crisis, with the S-300s to Cyprus and all of these issues. The AHEPA remained focused on its mission and it does it very, very well, including providing hospital care and education and social services. But the thrust of the foreign policy activity went to the other two organizations. AHEPA has always been in that mix, but more of a supportive role. And now we have a new organization that we see on the, uh, in the mix, uh, the Hellenic American Leadership Council. Hulk. And I would say HALC. Those three, sort of the, what was UHAC is now largely the Ashe, network Ashe, run. Pa, Ashe and HALC. And there's also the, the group of organizations that spawned out of UHAC because that was founded by a Chicago businessman, Andrew Athens, under the direction of Archbishop Iakovos. And Andrew Manitos and his son, Mike Manitos, mm -hmm. are involved in a number of organizations that are the offshoot of UHAC and also many Cypriot organizations like PSECA. Yes. The Hellenists of Cyprus have the organization of PSECA. Yes. So, do you want to say that the AHEPA is the one who has a community organization, και τελικώ επειδή δεν είχαν ω κύριο έργο τα θέματα εξωτερική πολιτική, βοηθούν τι άλλε οργανώσει. Και συνεργάζονται. Όλε οι οργανώσει. Ναι. Ο... Κάθε όμως, οργάνωση έχει το ρόλο τη. Τα τελευταία δύο χρόνια, yeah. τι συνέβη και είχαμε αυτά τα εκπληκτικά αποτελέσματα. What's changed is the decisions out of Ankara that have made Turkey a concern for American foreign policy specialists in a way that simply wasn't the case prior to this, these recent significant shifts under President Erdogan that, that seemed to misalign with NATO missions. And the major issue, of course, was the acquisition of the S-400s from Russia, yes. which are not only not compatible with NATO interoperability, equipment, armaments, and the like, but would essentially compromise the technology advancements that are in the F-35 program which Turkey was welcomed into years ago by the U.S., including offsets, so that the Turkish defense industries can improve their own military technological cap capabilities. And then they essentially violated not only the spirit of that sales agreement, but the letter of it by purchasing S-400s that would compromise our technological advancement. So you have a number of lawmakers in Washington, Savas, who were the biggest supporters of Turkey all of their careers who are now the, the greatest skeptics 
of the U.S.-Turkey relationship because they see Turkey moving in a direction away from the NATO alliance, away from U.S. policy objectives. And this is why they've imposed sanctions on Turkey. So just the way in 1975, the arms embargo on Turkey was not simply the work of the Greek-American community. It deserves great credit for what was achieved, but it was also the post-Vietnam era. There was a whole sense of a code of conduct and morality in U.S. foreign policy. And all of those lawmakers also pushed for the arms embargo on Turkey. The Greek-American community was part of a larger coalition. And now they're part of a larger coalition that involves strategic interests in the Eastern Mediterranean, in the Black Sea region, in the Middle East. And Turkey seems to be moving in a direction that makes it a less reliable and therefore less strategic ally inside the NATO alliance. But the Greek-American community has seen this opportunity and they're working with major Jewish American organizations, yeah. but, but not, yes, Armenian and Kurdish, but not just ethnic organizations. This is a strategic issue. And if there were no ethnic American concerns at all, it would still be a major violation of the trust between the United States and Turkey that the Turkish government has decided not only to proceed with the S-400 acquisition, but they're talking now about possibly purchasing additional systems which makes this an even more difficult relationship going forward. Κύριε Σιτιλίδη, αντιλαμβάνομαι, διαβάζω και εγώ τον τουρκικό τύπο και τον αμερικανικό, ότι η S-400 είναι ένα μεγάλο, ένα σοβαρό ζήτημα. Όμως δεν, δεν, δεν είναι λογικό μια στρατηγική σχέση που χτίστηκε από το 1952 μέχρι σήμερα μεταξύ της Ουάσιγκτον και της Άγκυρας να χαλάσει για τους S-400. Υπάρχουν και άλλα ζητήματα πιστεύω υπάρχουν ή είναι μόνο η S-400. Δηλαδή, μήπως η Τουρκία έχει προσπαθεί να αλλάξει και έναν γεωπολιτικό προσανατολισμό, μήπως θέλει να γίνει μια ανεξάρτητη δύναμη και μήπως είναι αυτό το πραγματικό πρόβλημα και όχι η S-400. It's a great question you're asking, Savas. The S-400, I would say, is the trigger issue. Because again, it, it threatens the viability and the technological security of our most advanced fighter systems <laughs> and, and will render them worthless if, say, Russia is able to better able to take out our F-35s in the event of a conflict because their S-400s were in a NATO allies territory. I mean, it defeats the purpose of that kind of armament preparation. It's a big problem, yeah. It's a colossal issue, but there are a number of other issues in recent years, really I would say since uh, Gezi Park in 2013, where there's been a, a turn not only in Turkish domestic policy, because that really turned many people sort of very skeptical about the human rights situation in Turkey. However problematic it was before 2013, what was done there turned many Turkish advocates into opponents of the Erdogan regime. You recall the brutality with which the Turkish police were unleashed on the demonstrators in Gezi Park. But the 2016 coup attempt was also a major issue because if it wasn't Erdogan himself, it was certainly his closest allies and those in the media that are controlled by his cronies and allies that essentially blamed the United States of America for the coup attempt, which is absurd. The U.S. would not engage in this kind of a coup attempt to overthrow the democratically elected government of a NATO ally, Turkey. Then we have the issue of Fethullah Gulen, who was Erdogan's partner until 2012 and is now considered public enemy number one and terrorist enemy number one. And he is, of course, residing in Pennsylvania. And the Turkish government, which has a different understanding of the rule of law than the United States government, maintains that we must extradite Fethullah Gülen, because Erdogan believes that he needs to be in a Turkish judicial system. And with the U.S. government under President Obama, President Trump, and now President Biden, so Democratic and Republican administrations have made very clear is the rule of law as we understand in the U.S. means that what the Turkish government has given to the United States does not warrant extradition. And we protect people in the United States against what we feel are violations of our laws by foreign governments. Then we had the episode where Erdogan came to Washington, D.C. several years ago, and his bodyguards beat up the Kurdish uh, demonstrators a in, in, in a public square. And now there's a very important lawsuit against the Turkish government that's being uh, initiated and advanced by 
a very uh, prominent Greek American attorney in the Washington DC area, and that's moving forward inside the US courts. But even if it weren't a Greek American component there, the fact that Turkish bodyguards, foreign bodyguards on American soil are beating up American citizens, was an extreme offense to many American lawmakers. And we haven't even talked about what is happening with the Syrian Kurds and the very, very profound disagreement between the United States and Turkey over the well-being of the Kurdish population in eastern Syria and how we best protect those populations from Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, and other radical Islamist terrorist organizations. And we're also concerned about the what we call the strategic drift of uh, Turkey away from what were better relations with Israel, dating back to the 1990s, uh, gold for oil with Iran, and possibly uh, a strategic realignment that's more in the direction of Chinese interests in the Middle East and the Black Sea region. So it's a whole host of concerns that seem to be indicating that Erdogan is pulling uh, Turkey away from the NATO alliance, maybe into an area of quote-unquote strategic depth, right, as his former foreign minister had advised, Mr. Davutoglu. Uh, but we are very much concerned that there are a number of issues that are, again, making Turkey a less reliable and therefore a less strategic partner for the United States and for the entire NATO alliance. But it's really the United States that has the most influence on Turkey. And so most NATO countries look to Washington to try to influence Ankara's uh, strategic decisions. But Erdogan has proven to be a very, very difficult partner in the NATO alliance in these many respects. And I think that's a larger understanding of why there's been this concern among many of Turkey's former supporters that we have a serious problem in this corner of Europe. With the Erdogan, he was born in a generation. A generation is 25 or 30 years. He came to the end of 2002. We have 2022. The kids who were born then were born with the logic and the nootropy of Erdogan. What do you think τι πιστεύεις εσύ προσωπικά, θα φύγει ο Ερντογάν, θα αλλάξει η Τουρκία ή πλέον η νοοτροπία του Ερντογάν έχει αποκτήσει ρίζες και θα έχουμε μια ελαφρά παραλλαγή της Τουρκίας που ξέρουμε, αν χάσει τις εκλογές του χρόνου. Σάβας, if I could predict the future, I'd be an extraordinarily wealthy man. Nobody can predict the future with any precision or exactitude, but what we can do and what I do in my geopolitical risk practice when I advise my clients is to point to where trend lines and directions seem to be taking decisions by foreign leaders and foreign governments. And there is, of course, contingency planning in Washington for a quote unquote post Erdogan Turkey. And whether it's the loss of the elections in the upcoming cycle, whether it's the end of an Erdogan regime at some time down the road, or whether it's simply a matter of one life ends and another life begins. Uh, there is consideration for what might be happening in Turkish politics, but there's no clear understanding as to whether or not there'll be a quote unquote uh, more amenable, more reliable partner in Ankara, whether it's Erdogan part two, or whether it's someone that is more difficult as a partner than Erdogan. There's no guarantee that post Erdogan that there was a more amenable government. There's still a pronounced and very virulent nationalist sentiment uh, inside of Turkish politics. Uh, even where you have sort of a less pro-Erdogan, more secular orientation, uh, it's still very secular, and Turkey will always be a torn nation between the secularists and the more Islamist types. And so I don't think you're going to have any type of harmony inside of Turkish policy anytime in the near future. And we also don't know what's going to be happening in terms of the Turkish economy and whether this downward spiral that Erdogan's policies seem to have taken the country in the last year to year and a half are going to profoundly impoverish such a significant portion of Turkish society that you have new parties springing up to take it in a completely different direction. Having said all of this, again, we can look at multiple scenarios, one year, three years, five years, 10 years. We also don't know if you have kind of a Turkish spring and you have a more liberal, consensual, European-oriented government, the way many people thought, one might say in retrospect were fooled, under the first Erdogan term, right? In 2002, 2003, 
There were so many in Europe and in the West who thought we have a reformer yes, here. Yes, yes. And then once he won re-election, we began to see him move in a very different direction. So the hope is that, and I think from a Greek perspective, we're here in Greece today, that the more European Turkey is, the better neighbor it is for Greece. Because Greece wants to live with all of its European neighbors peacefully, with shared prosperity and shared security and defense objectives. Not one that publishes maps that terrorize sort of the Greek sense of security and sovereignty and, and legal claims. But it's very difficult to predict where this is going to go because it's ultimately up to the Turkish people. And what's interesting is whatever authoritarian direction Erdogan seems to have taken the country in recent years, there really is still a longing among many Turks for legitimate democratic electoral procedures. I mean, one of the reasons why Erdogan does what he does in reorienting the Turkish constitution is because elections have legitimacy in Turkey. And if you recall, in the last election cycle, when he wasn't pleased with the outcome in Istanbul, he demanded a second vote, a, a, re a recall vote of sorts. Yes, yes. And he came out in a worse position afterwards, and he had to accept it. Now, we don't know what's going to be happening between now and the next election cycle, and to what extent he's able to manipulate the democratic process in Turkey uh, in terms of media coverage, in terms of the wealth that he's able to exploit with all of those that he has made rich over the last 20 years, this new generation of wealthy Turks that really owe their well-being to him. And it's a very, a very difficult and challenging environment for his competitors and his political opponents. But there could also be such profound and deep dis dissatisfaction in Turkey now because his rise really was predicated on what he was able to do to root out corruption initially from the prior secularists and also this enrichment of Turkish society at a third generation level. And now if they're moving backwards into a more impoverished condition, they'll take it out on Erdogan. So it remains to be seen it's going to be a very compelling electoral season going forward. But I think the longer term perspective is so unknown. It's better to be prepared for all contingencies. Yeah. Να κάνω μια δύσκολη ερώτηση. Όλε είναι δύσκολε. Πριν από τρία χρόνια, οι Ηνωμένε Πολιτείε Αμερική σκότωσαν τον Αλ Αμπουμπάκρ Αλ Μπαγδάτη. Mm -hmm. Μετά από δύο χρόνια, σκότωσαν τον επόμενο αρχηγό του ΆΙΣΙΣ, mm -hmm. τον Αλ Κουσέιρι. Mm -hmm. Πριν από δέκα ημέρε, σκότωσαν τον τελευταίο ηγέτη τη Αλ Κάιτα, τον Τζιντέρε, ο Κουσέιρι στο Ατμέχ. Και οι τρεις σκοτώθηκαν 3-4-5 χιλιόμετρα από τα σύνορα με την Τουρκία σε περιοχές που ελέγχει η Τουρκία. Πόσο λογικό είναι οι Ηνωμένε Πολιτείε της Αμερικής να έχουν νεκρούς από τον, από τον Άισις. Να πολεμούν από το 2011-2012 τον Άισις. Έχουν κάνει αγώνες. Έχουν ξοδέψει δισεκατομμύρια δολάρια. Στη Μοσούλη, στη Ράκα, στο Κομπάνι, mm. στην Μέμπετς, στην Τερεζόρ και ακόμα και τώρα έχουμε μάχες ακόμα. Διότι το ISIS, το Ισλαμικό κράτος, ζωντανό είναι ακόμα. Και αν, αν χαλαρώσει ο συνασπισμός θα εμφανιστεί πάλι. Ιδιαίτερα εκεί στην Τερεζόρ, στις περιοχές, στην Άλμα Ιαντίν, υπάρχουν οι ασυρέτα, αυτές οι φυλές των Αράβων, είναι φανατικοί. Είτε με το Σαντάμ, είτε με τον Άισις. Mm -hmm. Άρα, αν χαλαρώσει λίγο, θα ξαναφυτρώσει. Πόσο όμως λογικό φαίνεται οι Ηνωμένες Πολιτείες Αμερικής να πολεμάνε και να ξοδεύουν και να σκοτώνονται Αμερικανοί και Κούρδοι μαζί πολεμάτε mm -hmm. ε, στον αγώνα εναντίον του Άισις και οι τε, τρεις αρχηγοί να είναι υπό την προστασία της Τουρκίας. Αυτό... Ένας ουδέτερος αντικειμενικός παρατηρητής δεν μπορεί να το κατανοήσει. Πώς συμβαίνει αυτό; I obviously don't have a clear answer on this and almost nobody outside of the most sensitive US military operations would have a clear answer to that. But just because an area comes under the larger general control of one military or another, it does not mean they have absolute control over every inch of the territory. These radical Islamist terrorists are fiendishly brilliant in many ways, and they're able to hide among civilian populations. They know the territory. 
They are able to thrive and operate out in the wilderness in conditions that most military uh, personnel are not able to, except for, say, special forces and the like. And they've been able to do this. Uh, there have been concerns uh, in the past when Islamic State was formed in that region back around 10 years ago or so, as you state, that a number of these individuals came into the area through Turkey. That was a concern that was expressed by the U.S. government at that time. Uh, and it was only after Islamic State had metastasized to an area the size of the United Kingdom, or if we look at the United yes, States, yes, the yes. state of Pennsylvania or Ohio. It was a, a huge territory yeah. there. And then we began to see that Turkey began to take positions that were somewhat contrary to the earlier sense of allowing terrorists to move into Syria because the Turkish government was opposed to Assad. And they were looking to see how these terrorists might be able to overthrow the Assad regime. We work closely with the Syrian Kurds, who are the most determined, most skilled fighters in that area. No one wants to fight the Syrian Kurds, men and women, yeah, <laughs> the toughest yeah, women in the yeah, world, perhaps. Yeah. But it became obviously a very difficult issue in the U.S.-Turkey relationship because the Turks then accused the United States of supporting the so-called cousins or brothers of the Marxist-Leninist Kurdish Workers' Party, the Kurdistan Workers' yes. Party, the PKK. Mm -hmm. And that's also become a very difficult issue, Savas, in the U.S.-Turkey relationship to this day, where Turkish ambassadors and Turkish diplomats in Washington will tell Americans very simply, what if you believed that we in Turkey were supporting al-Qaeda after September 11th? How would you feel about us? That's how we feel about what you're doing in Syria with the YPG. And so it's a very, very difficult issue, and we simply have very different perspectives. Our position from a U.S. government pers perspective, and I don't speak for the U.S. government, but I work with people in Washington yes, who, yes. of all administrations, Democratic and Republican, is that the Syrian Kurds are not helping the PKK in their operations inside of Turkey for any type of dismemberment operations there. They serve an essential role, and right now, after President Trump's decision to pull back most of our forces from eastern Syria, we are still providing training and very sensitive security and intelligence sharing operations with the Kurds. They have not been, quote unquote, abandoned. We simply have lessened our military presence, especially after Russia took on such an important role in Syria. And now, in many ways, Russia is the other superpower that figures in so many considerations in the Middle East. Most people like to keep pointing fingers at the United States as the only superpower that operates in the Middle East. And that's certainly not the case. It wasn't the case before, but it's certainly not the case after 2015. So uh, I don't have any specific clear information that's open source uh, intelligence on that. But uh, where there is concern about how some individuals find themselves in areas we prefer them to not be, I presume that's being handled at a very sensitive level between governments. Γιατί ερώτησα αυτή την ερώτηση και είπα ότι είναι δύσκολη. Η Τουρκία πρόσφατα είναι μια, ο, ο, ο καταστατικός χάρτης του ΝΑΤΟ στο προήμιο λέει ότι οι χώρες μέλη του ΝΑΤΟ πρέπει να, προ, να υπηρετούν τις δημοκρατικές αρχές, να σέβονται τα ανθρώπινα δικαιώματα και να έχουν κράτος δικαίου. Mm -hmm. Η Τουρκία δεν, έχει δημοκρατική, δεν σέβεται τις δημοκρατικές αρχές, δεν σέβεται τα ανθρώπινα δικαιώματα και δεν είναι κράτος δικαίου. Και εκβίαζε δύο κράτη που σέβονται αυτές τις τρεις αρχές, τη Σουηδία και την ε, Φιλανδία, Φιλανδία, να παραδιάσουν αυτές τις τρεις αρχές για να γίνουν μέλη του ΝΑΤΟ. Εδώ κάτι δεν, κάτι δεν πάει καλά. Όμως είδα ότι έγιναν καλοί χειρισμοί, δηλαδή είδα, διάβασα Τούρκους διπλωμάτες που λένε ότι η Αμερικανική διπλωματία στο παρασκήνιο οδήγησε τα πράγματα σε επιτυχία, υπογράφηκε αυτό το μνημόνιο. Όμως παρόλα αυτά, δεν μπορεί στο όνομα του ΝΑΤΟ η Τουρκία να, να εκβιάζει δύο χώρες να παραδιάσουν τις αρχές του ΝΑΤΟ για να γίνουν μέλη του ΝΑΤΟ. Αυτό η Αμερικανική διπλωματία και η Αμερικανική πολιτική διανόηση πώς το, πώς το είδε, πώς το αντιμετώπισε. Δεν μιλάω πολιτικά, μιλώ θεωρητικά. Πώς... Πώς, πώς, το, πώς το δέχονται αυτό το πράγμα. Η ερώτησή σας είναι θεωρητική. Εγώ σας απαντάω ρεαλιστικά. Ναι. Εντάξει. Ναι. This is Turkey today. And I often put myself in the position of any government that I'm analyzing if I'm the top strategic advisor to the prime minister or president of that country. Mm -hmm. So I 
take off my American hat and I'll put on a Greek hat or a Cypriot hat or in this instance a Turkish hat. Erdogan will use every tool at his disposal to achieve what he feels are his country's national interests. Those national interests don't always align with those of the United States or the NATO alliance. And he sees an opportunity here to be able to gain on other issues by exploiting the possible veto of the entry of Sweden and Finland into the NATO alliance, which, by the way, is not a done deal. It's not a done deal. There may be an understanding. There may be an agreement. But until that vote is done, it's not done. So we don't know what's going to happen. And if there are other issues that pull Turkey apart from the United States, from Germany, the UK probably not, but other countries inside NATO, Greece, obviously, then we could see Turkey coming back. And either it's these other issues, as we to megalo to bazari pou pezete, or it could be issues, or it could be the issue of the Kurds and the Kurdish offices in Sweden and Finland that are the ostensible reason for the Turkish complaint about those two countries' activities involving Kurdish interests in Turkey, in Syria, in Iraq, and in Iran. But there may be other issues as well. And that is perhaps the S-400s, the sanctions regime, and other issues where, give me something here, I'll give you something over here. So until Sweden and Finland are actually in the NATO alliance, it's an open question as to whether or not this will take place. And Erdogan will maximally exploit this opportunity to, again, to achieve what he sees are his various national interests on a whole number of fronts in ways that do not necessarily comport with the activities of other countries. So as you say, on human rights, on democratic principles, on respect for the rule of law, there may be a Turkish definition or interpretation that is different than that of Greece or the United States or France or Portugal. And they'll exploit that to be able to achieve their interests, whereas other countries might say, we're going to put our national interests in always primary, every responsible government has to take care of his or her country's national interest first. But you also see where you can compromise to be able to take care of alliance interests. And that's what it means to be a good alliance member. You're not just looking for your own country's interests, but those of the larger alliance, or you're not a good alliance member. Turkey increasingly seems to be singularly focused only on Turkey at the expense of the NATO alliance. And that's what causes all of these new problems. Να πάμε στην τελευταία ερώτηση, την πιο δύσκολη. Το 1974, επειδή είναι και οι μέρες τέτοιες, σαν χθες έγινε το πραξικόπημα στην Κύπρο. Και αυτό άνοιξε την πόρτα στον Ατήλα. Οι Ηνωμένες Πολιτείες Αμερικής είχαν κάποιους σχεδιασμούς για την Ανατολική Μεσόγειο. Και μέρος αυτών των σχεδιασμών πιθανόν να ήταν και να χωριστεί το νησί η Κύπρο στη μέση. Πέρασαν από τότε 48 χρόνια. Αν ήσασταν εσείς ως στρατηγικός σχεδιαστής, τότε και τώρα, πέτυχε αυτός ο σχεδιασμός. Δηλαδή αυτό που η Τουρκία σχεδιάζει ίσως να προσαρτήσει τα κατεχόμενα, να τα κάνει τον 82ο νομό της Τουρκίας mm-hmm. και να κάνει εκεί μια ναυτική βάση, μια αεροπορική βάση mm-hmm. και να έχει πια στρατηγική επιρροή στην Ανατολική Μεσόγειο. Σε ολόκληρη την Ανατολική Μεσόγειο. Αυτό είναι κάτι που το είχε υπολογίσει αυτός που σχεδίασε την πολιτική για το Κυπριακό τότε. Αυτό ευχαριστεί της, το Ισραήλ. Ευχαριστεί την Αίγυπτο. Ευχαριστεί τις ΟΠΑ. Αφήστε την Κύπρο και την Ελλάδα. Να μην μιλήσουμε μεροληπτικά. Είναι κάτι που θα το δεχθούν, ναι. Θα το δεχθούν αυτό. Να ελέγξει ολόκληρη την Κύπρο, για παράδειγμα, η, η Τουρκία. Και να γίνει κυρίαρχο στην Ανατολική Μεσόγειο. Τι πιστεύετε. Θεωρητικά μιλάμε. Δεν μιλάμε θεωρητικά. Η ερώτησή σα είναι. Απαντάμε ρεαλιστικά. Πάντα. Ναι. Uh, I'm sure that there are contingency plans in place for the possible Turkish annexation of the occupied territory of Cyprus. Not only from a US perspective, But how does the NATO alliance respond? Now, it's not a NATO issue per se, because Cyprus, unfortunately, is not in the NATO alliance. And in retrospect, probably one of the worst decisions that was ever made by a Cypriot government back in the 1960s was to reject NATO membership as part of a larger compromise. If it were in NATO, it probably would have been impossible 
situation for Turkey to have invaded in 1974. But what's done is done, so we can't change the past. Um, and I want to take this approach. I, I, don't, I don't think it's important for my purposes here, Savas, with all due respect, whether this is in Israel's interest. It's not my concern from a Washington perspective. It's what is best from a regional perspective and what works for the United States and our partners here in the region and Europe-wide. And looking back, of course, it was a colossal diplomatic error after the invasion to allow it to remain in the condition that it's been in now for a tragic 48 years. And whatever was happening in the fog of war, and remember what was happening in Washington, D.C., was a constitutional crisis. We had a president of the United States yes, yes, yes. who was largely not only inattentive to the invasion of a non-NATO country, but it was a non-NATO country that was part of the quote-unquote third world that many people in the U.S. government at the time was too cozy with the Soviet Union. So there wasn't that great concern for protecting Cyprus. It would have been a different story if it was an invasion of Greece. And that would have been a colossal crisis inside the NATO alliance. And there's no provision, of course, in the NATO treaty for intra-alliance conflict. So if, God forbid, there's a, uh, an episode in the Aegean that escalates out of control, I mean, there's contingency planning, but it could be the end of the NATO alliance as we know it today. But on Cyprus, all we can do today is look back over the last 48 years and say, where have been the multiple failings? And I don't want to make this an American issue only because I think it's very unfair to put the entire burden on the United States. The U.S. was not responsible for the invasion. The Greek junta was. What we could have done better is to bring the parties to come together to forge the right kind of solution that was going to address the independence of the Republic of Cyprus and the strategic interests of Greece and Turkey in the region. Because one cannot ignore Turkey's interest. Because if you do, they're going to make you know what it is. Cannot ignore them. The problem that we have is that the law doesn't work very well for Turkey in the Mediterranean Sea. And we see that now with the issue of the exclusive economic zones. If one follows the UN clause, the Convention on the Law of the Sea, you see that Cyprus has its lawful EEZ. Greece has its lawful EEZ. They essentially meet south of Turkey. And because of those extensive EEZs, Turkey has a relatively small one compared to both Cyprus and Turkey. And this goes back to the Cyprus issue, as you correctly laid it out, Savas. Turkey sees itself, like I pretend I'm in Ankara, looking south towards the Mediterranean Sea. And I see this enormous coastline. And then I see Greek islands, Rhodes, Castelloriza, and then I see Cyprus, and I'm thinking, this is oppositional territory, right, south of Turkey on the Mediterranean Sea, that is preventing my great country, the inheritor of the Ottoman Empire, from achieving its maritime goals in the Mediterranean Sea. That's their thinking. Right or wrong, you have to contend with it. And what we try to do is explain to them, this is not a hostile situation. This is a legal issue. We must respect the rule of law, including international law. And the ideal is for Turkey to not consider Cyprus and Greece as hostile neighbors, but to consider Greece a NATO ally and partner with which it should live in peace and prosperity. And Cyprus as a smaller country that can be very beneficial for the Turkish Cypriots and for Turkey, Cyprus poses zero security dilemma for Turkey. It's essentially unarmed, and no one in their right mind thinks that Cyprus is ever going to be. It. It's a ludicrous proposition. And so Turkey should instead be improving its relations, like they talked about many years ago with the zero uh, problems strategy. And now they have hilia problemata meton kathe gitona. So, so it's very unfortunate that Ankara has moved in this direction. And they really are, I think, at the heart of the problem in resolving the Cyprus issue because they've never made clear what their eventual goal is. So you laid out the possibility of a naval base and an air base and a permanent presence on what the British used to call the immovable or permanent aircraft carrier that is Cyprus. And even with all of the advanced technology today, uh, Savas, Cyprus is still an extraordinarily strategic piece of territory, if one simply looks at all of the intelligence gathering that the U.S. and the United Kingdom conduct from the British bases and from the Troodos Mountains, this is all open source intelligence. Yes, yes, yes. yes. In Turkey, deep into the Middle East and the like, and now the partnership, going back to your earlier question about uh, Greece, Cyprus, and Israel, 
cooperating on energy, cooperating on counterterrorism, cooperating on counter uh, proliferation of armaments and the like. These are very important issues for the U.S. and our partners, and we want Turkey to be part of this framework. Turkey, unfortunately, continues to find ways to exclude itself from this larger pro-Western, pro-peace, pro-shared prosperity framework. And the most difficult thing for us in the United States is to persuade our Turkish friends that their policies are harming their own country's interests and that Turkey would be moving in a better direction, not only for the Turkish government, but for 80 million Turkish people. We should want the best for them, the way we want the best for the people of every country in the region. We don't want the citizens to suffer because of the, the decisions of their governments. We want the Turkish people to be as prosperous as the Greeks and everyone else in Europe. But their government's decisions are what are holding them back. So how do we sort of fix this problem? It's one of the most difficult strategic issues we have because the NATO alliance is essentially indissoluble. There's no mechanism for dealing with an intransigent NATO partner. There's no mechanism for removing or rejecting a member of NATO. So if Turkey were to move in a direction that makes it a completely unreliable ally of the United States and the NATO alliance, the only realistic option would be to dissolve NATO and form a new defensive alliance based on human rights, based on respect for individual dignity, based on the rule of law. But that's an extraordinarily sort of difficult proposition to get to down the road. And it would only be probably in the most calamitous of conditions, unfortunately, something like a Turkish war against Greece. And we don't want to see that ever materialize, Savas. Τελευταία ερώτηση. Yes, Ήταν η προηγου... προηγούμενη τελευταία, αυτή η τελευταία, η πιο δύσκολη. Με δύο, σκε... με δύο σκέλη. Το ένα είναι, μονολεκτικά, πόσες πιθανότητες δίνουν στην Αμερική να ξεσπάσει ένας ελληνοτορκικός πόλεμος που θα είναι η καταστροφή του ΝΑΤΟ. Πιθανότητες, μια λέξη θέλω. Και δεύτερον. Και Δεν δεύτερον, υπάρχει μια λέξη, θα το εξηγήσω. Πόσο της εκατό, δέκα, μηδέν, δύο, θα είναι η καταστροφή. Και για να μην γίνει ελληνοτουρκικός πόλεμος, πρέπει η Αμερική να παίξει το ρόλο της. Η Ελλάδα θα αντισταθεί. Και αν αντισταθεί θα γίνει πόλεμος. Η Τουρκία επιτίθεται. Τα βλέπουμε στους χάρτες. Αυτά λοιπόν πόσο προβληματίζουν την Ουάσιντον και τι πιθανότητες. 3%, 5% και δεύτερον. Ξέρουμε ότι οι ΗΠΑ έχουν μια συμμαχία με τους Κούρδους στη Συρία. Γενικώ, όταν βλέπουν η Τουρκία να παραβιάζει τα δικαιώματα 20 εκατομμυρίων Κούρδων. Ο Σελαχατίν Τεμπερτάς είναι στη φυλακή. 10 βουλευτές στη φυλακή. 50 δήμαρχοι στη φυλακή. Εκλέχτηκαν με 70-80%. Οι άνθρωποι τραγουδάει ένα στο γάμο κουρδικά, το βάζουν, τον παίρνουν στο δικαστήριο. Θέλει να βάλει το, όνομα, το παιδί του κουρδικό όνομα, το απαγορεύουν. Μόνο ο Κιμ Ιλ Ιούγκ είναι χειρότερο καθεστώς από αυτό της Τουρκίας σε όλο τον κόσμο. Αυτό το θέμα, το θέμα των ανθρωπίνων δικαιωμάτων και γενικά το κουρδικό πρόβλημα, σε τι βαθμό απασχολεί θεωρητικά την Ουάσιγκτον. Πάλι θεωρητικά. Για να μην σε βέρω σε δύσκολη θέση. So on the first question, um, the, the very, very dangerous possibility of a Greek-Turkish war has been, the avoidance of that has been probably the primary concern of the United States government in Southeastern Europe and in the Eastern Mediterranean for the last 50 years. Really since 60 years, since the intercommunal violence in Cyprus mm -hmm. in 1963, the very famous Johnson letter episode, yes, that was yes, the first yes, great yes. shock mm -hmm. in US-Turkey relations over the Cyprus issue. And then, of course, with the invasion and ongoing occupation of Cyprus. But at the same time, in 1973, and you and your audience knows this better than I do, Savas, was the beginning of the Aegean disputes. Now, I remember spending nights monitoring developments in the United States with what happened with the EMEA crisis in January, February of 1996. Really, probably the most, the closest we came to a Greek-Turkish war in all this time. And they almost came to blows that night, January 31 into February 1. Very, very perilous times over an uninhabited rocky islet. But every responsible government 
will defend every inch of its territory, militarily if necessary, even if only goats are on it. If that's your sovereign territory, it's your government's obligation to defend it. Okay? So every government must defend its property to the very end. And when the other army comes on your property, you use a military to push them out, even if it comes at great sacrificial cost, or else your government basically falls. You don't have the confidence of your people. So the United States government has been very much concerned about the possibility, very real possibility, either over the Aegean disputes or over Cyprus, of a war between Turkey and Greece all of these years. And it's why we've given very, very great care to maintaining as careful a balance as possible. This comes up in terms of what was formerly economic aid, but especially military armaments for the governments here, and the need for the U.S. government to often come in as a quote-unquote honest broker between Greece and Turkey, and I know in many instances, the Greek people feel that the U.S. has been an honest broker to a fault because of the impression that it was the Turkish government that was violating Greece's sovereign rights, Greece's territorial waters, Greece's territorial airspace, the gray zones issues. Now we have, again, this new call for the demilitarization of a number of islands off the Turkish coast. And, of course, the ongoing occupation of Cyprus in violation of international law and possibly U.S. law in terms of the use of U.S. weapons for offensive purposes. So a whole laundry list of issues that are of great concern to the Greek people. But the U.S. is also very careful to ensure that no policy errors take place that we, quote unquote, push Turkey farther away than it's already pushing itself. We're dealing with very difficult governments in many parts of the world, Savas, and this transitions to the second question. You've laid out a number of very serious human rights problems that the Kurdish minority faces in Turkey. These are issues that, that U.S. ambassadors and U.S. governments and especially U.S. presidents will bring to the table every time they'll meet. I'd say with Turkish presidents, but it's really been one for the last 20 years. Uh, it was sort of a very sort of less democratic uh, process there, unfortunately. But ultimately, all we can do is impress upon them how important these issues are with us, but we don't have any say into how the judicial system operates in Turkey. The same thing happens with issues like the ecumenical patriarchate and the issue of religious freedom in Turkey. That issue comes up on the agenda every time a U.S. president has met with Erdogan and they met with Erdogan's predecessors. Going back to 1971, and all the other issues that make life very difficult for the Greek minority in Istanbul, in and for the, the patriarchate. The Kurdish issues, the human rights abuses of Turkish citizens, let alone the Kurdish minority. These always come up, but then we put them in a larger context. Again, I come back to the realist school, not the theoretical school. We have very important allies and partners in other parts of the world. Egypt, which also has what we would call a very, very oppressive human rights repression. Saudi Arabia, President Biden just took a great deal of criticism from his own base inside the Democratic Party that considers Saudi Arabia one of the most vile uh, abusers of human rights across many fronts inside its borders. Even a country that's more closely aligned now with China than it is with the United States, Pakistan, because of its critical location between Iran and Afghanistan and Central Asia, we're dealing with governments around the world that do not operate the way that we do in the West. And Turkey came into the NATO alliance as a Western country during the Cold War. But there are many Savas who would posit that today, if Turkey were in Sweden or Finland's position, it would never be admitted into the NATO alliance because of the direction that it's taken over the last number of years. But Turkey is a NATO member. There are institutional ties between Turkey's military, the U.S. military and the NATO military establishments. There are deep diplomatic institutional ties. And yes, there are profound differences and profound problems and profound disagreements with the Turkish government. But these institutional ties run very deep. And what the U.S. and the West want is to ensure that we don't have a Turkey that is outwardly hostile towards Greece, towards the West, towards Cyprus in the EU, and causes even worse problems than anything that we've seen over the last five years. So it's a very difficult balance that we try to maintain here. But we look at everything from a regional perspective. We don't put on blinders and just look at the U.S.-Turkey relationship. We don't just look at the Greek-Turkish relationship. We look at the panoply of issues that affect Greece in the Balkans, in Northern Africa, in the Middle East. With Turkey, we look at Russia, Ukraine, Central Asia, South Asia, the Middle East, Northern Africa. 
You look at the fact that the Turks are now establishing bases in several African countries. They're establishing deep military sales agreements with half a dozen African nations. These drones that they're building turned the war in uh, Azerbaijan's favor against Armenia several years ago. Ethiopia, Libya. So Turkey plays a very dynamic role, for better or for worse, in a number of very critical security issues from as far north as uh, Russia and now Sweden and Finland, deep into Africa, as far uh, east as Afghanistan and Pakistan, as far west as Libya, with its presence there now in the civil war. Washington. It's not necessarily good. It doesn't have to be bad, but it all depends really on Erdogan. And all we can do is use all the energy that we have at our disposal as the United States government and working with fellow governments in Europe to try to persuade Turkey to move in a direction that is better for the Turkish people. But we have not been able to persuade Erdogan to do that yet. Me vlepete na gelao yati. Yati vlepo ena elniko mnyalo stino Washington na gnorizi toso kala τις γεωπολιτικές ισορροπίες σε όλο τον κόσμο και γιατί όχι να παρέχει συμβουλές στην Αμερικανική κυβέρνηση. Από αυτή τη θέση λοιπόν στους συγχωριανούς σας στην Αγία Κυριακή, στην Πεπονιά, στη Μεσοποταμία, στην ε, Διποταμία, τι, στο Καλοχώρι, τι, ε, τι έχετε να τους πείτε, να τους δώσετε ένα χαιρετισμό. <laughs> Αυτό είναι ευαίσθητο θέμα για σας, μένα. Σας καμαρώνουν τώρα. <laughs> Δεν ξέρω άμα με καμαρώνουν, αλλά ξέρω... Είμαι ξε... σίγουρος εγώ γι' αυτό. Ξέρουν όλοι... Γιατί και εγώ σας καμαρώσω. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ξέρουν όλοι οι συγγενείς μας πως, πόσο υπερήφανος είμαι εγώ που είμαι πόντιος από τις καταγωγές στην Καστοριά, στην Κοζάνη και στην Πόντο και που σαν Έλληνο Αμερικανός είμαι πρώτα απ' όλα Αμερικανός πολίτης και είμαι εγώ αγαπώ την Αμερική. Είναι η χώρα μου. Αλλά είμαι και πάρα πολύ υπερήφανος από τον Ελληνισμό, όπως είπαμε, τις ρίζες μας και όπως είπε νομίζω στην αρχή που έχω φέρει την οικογένειά μου εδώ στην Ελλάδα, τα παιδιά μου χαίρονται που ταξιδεύουν στην Ελλάδα και με το καλό εμεί θα συνεχίσουμε να κάνουμε ό,τι μπορούμε να δυναμώσουμε τις σχέσεις μεταξύ Ελλάδα και Ηνωμένες Πολιτείες σαν Έλληνο-Αμερικανοί, σαν Αμερικανοί πολίτες, να βοηθήσουμε την κυβέρνησή μας στην Ουάσιντιν να υποστηρίζει και να παίρνει τα σωστά μέτρα εδώ, αλλά πάντα με το μάτι μας πώς βλέπει οι Ηνωμένες Πολιτείες τον κόσμο και δεν είναι πάντα σύμφωνα με πώς βλέπει ο τάδε Έλληνας πολίτης τον κόσμο. Και εμεί έχουμε μία άλλη ευθύνη, Σάβα, αν θα με επιτρέψετε, Δυστυχώ για όλο τον κόσμο. Μετά από τον δεύτερο παγκόσμιο πόλεμο, εμεί δεν το ζητήσαμε αυτό το Σας ρόλο. Σα έδωσε την σκητάλη η Αγγλία. Πάρτε. Η Αγγλία μα το, το μετάφερε και τώρα εμεί είμαστε. Είναι μεγάλη υπεύθυνοι. ευθύνη αυτή. Εμεί είμαστε, α πούμε, υπεύθυνοι για την τάξη ω γύρω τον κόσμο. Στην Ασία, στην Αφρική, στην Ευρώπη, στη Λατινική Αμερική. Και τώρα μπαίνουμε σε πολύ επικίνδυνο, πιστεύω εγώ, αιώνα μπροστά μα με το κινέζικο τον κίνδυνο, το κομμουνιστικό κόμμα της Κίνας που είναι ο εχθρός της, Τώρα, τα, της διεθνής Γιάννη, τάξεως. Εδώ, επειδή τελείωσε η συνέντευξή μας, αλλά θα σου πω, όταν τους δίνατε τεχνογνωσία και λεφτά για να παράγουν φτηνά προϊόντα και να ανθίσει το αμερικάνικο όνειρο, κανένα στην Ουάστον δεν σκεφτόταν ότι με αυτά τα λεφτά θα δημιουργήσετε ένα πρόβλημα μεγάλο για τις ΗΠΑ. I'm going to go back to my English now, Savas. This is a brilliant question that you ask. In retrospect, maybe one of the most colossal errors ever made in U.S. diplomatic history was welcoming China into the World Trade Organization and allowing them to accelerate the rate of their economic growth, believing that they would become more Western, more open and freer and become more like us in the West, like the United States and like Europe. And instead, we've accelerated the rise of maybe the most dangerous country that the world has seen, certainly since Nazi Germany, far more dangerous than the Soviet Union was and that communism ever was, because this is military, militarily powerful, extraordinarily wealthy, and it has an agenda to dominate the world by 2049. They say it openly in their speeches, Savas. And I will just draw this one comparison. I know we're short on time. Similarly, you see now the colossal strategic error 
committed by the German government, the stupidity of becoming so utterly dependent on Russia for its energy, thinking that that change would come through trade and never expecting Russia to use that energy dependence as a weapon against Germany and now against the European Union. And in a similar way, I'm very concerned that the U.S. is becoming dependent on China for solar panels, for wind turbines to support a green energy agenda in the United States that Russia can then use to squeeze the American economy down the road. And we're paying them to do it. So I, I'm very much concerned about both American directions and European directions vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia. And we should be taking care of our own security, our own energy independence, and helping each other as Western capitalist democracies and not being dependent on our enemies. Yanni, the Chinese don't have only strategic issues, they don't have only economic issues, they don't have only ήρθαν στα πανεπιστήμια σας yes. και πήραν όλο, όλη τη σκέψη, τη γνώση και τη σοφία που είχε συγκεντρωθεί, την πήραν, την πήγαν στην Κίνα. Το ίδιο κάνουν και με τη Ρωσία. Στα πανεπιστήμια τους στέλνουν παιδιά. Μπορώ να σας διακόψω. Ναι. Τους καλέσαμε γιατί πλήρωναν όλο τον κόσμο τα χρήματα να μπουν στα πανεπιστήμια μας και με, το ίδιο, με την ίδια ιδέα μας επέτρεψαν να κάνουμε εμεί εμπόριο στην Κίνα που έχουν εκεί 1,4 δισεκατομμύρια πληθυσμό, έχει να κάνει αυτό με το συμφέρον του κέρδους, του χρήματος. Ναι. Και, και, Όταν... και ακόμα μας κλέβουν την τεχνολογία μας και εμείς κοιμισμένοι τους επιτρέπουμε. Και αυτό δεν είπαμε πριν. Το λέμε ειλικρινά. Και... We're asleep at the switch. Εκτός αυτού, όταν θέλει, η... θέλει ο Άνσεπτον να αντιμετωπίσει το Πεκίνο, την Κίνα, δεν είναι καλύτερο να πάρει μαζί τη Ρωσία για να τη στρέψει στην Κίνα. Τώρα μήπως πήγε, σβρόξατε την Κίνα, τη Ρωσία μαζί με την Κίνα, πώς θα αντιμετωπίσει η Αμερική και τους δυο. Γιατί να μην είχε τη Ρωσία δεμένη από εδώ με κάποιο τρόπο. Μέχρι πριν λίγα χρόνια είχε πρέσβη η Ρωσία στο ΝΑΤΟ. Σωστό. Yes. Υπήρχε μια στρατηγική εκεί. Ποιο τη χάλασε αυτή. Ποιο μυαλό στρατηγικό τη χάλασε. Θα μου επιτρέψετε να σας πω, η κάθε ερώτηση είναι πιο σημαντική από την τελευταία που με ρωτάτε εδώ. So, if we think not tactically, the way most Western thinking right now is on the Russia-Ukraine war. There's a great deal of emotion here. There's a great deal of antipathy for Vladimir Putin as an authoritarian dictator of Russia. And this has become almost a battle of good versus evil. But we're facing a calamitous situation in terms of European security. The possibility that Germans will go hungry and cold this winter, the most advanced industrial nation in Europe. Things that we were inconceivable six months ago because of, I think, a, an almost reckless policy of trying to sanction Russia and punish Russia as if Russia didn't have tools it could use against Europe and the West and possibly now using food as a weapon against Northern Africa and the Middle East. My concern is that we're taking our eye off the strategic target, and that's China. And just the way we Americans have been talking for several years now, it started under the end of the Obama administration. Trump took it a much higher level. We'll see where the Biden administration takes it, this shift towards the Indo-Pacific region. But we keep getting distracted, whether it was in the Middle East, now it's in Ukraine. Meanwhile, China is menacing Taiwan. China is building aircraft carriers. China is seeking, as we were saying before, to develop a military capability that is equal to that of the United States in terms of global power projection by 2035. That's their openly stated goal. I don't read Mandarin. I read all the translations. They, they say all of this, Savas. And the strategic card to play would be to find a way to have some type of a, I don't want to say accommodation with Russia, but an understanding with Russia that Europe poses no serious threat to Russian interests and to understand Russia's security concerns about what is happening in Ukraine and NATO enlargement and see where they're legitimate, but to make sure that we don't drive Russia into economic dependency on China. And then we have a Eurasian bloc that will be far more dangerous to the United States, far more dangerous to the future of Europe, and really turn the world in a very different direction in the second half of this century. That to me is what must be avoided. The Ukraine issue is a tactical issue. The China issue is the strategic issue. Yes. And we're missing the ball right on that right now 
We must keep focused on China, Taiwan, and find a way to address this issue to deal with the strategic concern, and we're not doing that properly right now. Δεν θα σε ρωτήσω, θα κλείσω τη συνέντευξή μας λέγοντας αν ήμουν εγώ Αμερικανός θα φρόντιζα εδώ και 30 χρόνια η Ρωσία να μην δώσει στρατιωτική τεχνολογία στην Κίνα. Χωρίς την στρατιωτική τεχνολογία της Ρωσίας η Κίνα δεν θα μπορούσε να γίνει right. μεγάλη στρατιωτική δύναμη. Mm-hmm. Άρα εκεί πρέπει να υπάρχει ένα λάθος στρατηγικής. Έπρεπε πριν 30 χρόνια να τα δούμε αυτά. Τώρα το πρόβλημα δεν λύνεται εύκολα. Τέλος πάντων, ευχαριστώ πολύ. Εγώ σας ευχαριστώ. Σε κουράσαμε. Καθόλου, καθόλου. Χαρά μου. Σε, και, σε... και τιμή μου. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Και εγώ ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ. Πιστεύω πραγματικά ότι οι Έλληνες πολίτες, ε, επειδή υπάρχουν και διάφορες, ε, έρχονται θολές και οι πολιτικές των ΗΠΑ, δεν μπορεί να καταλάβει ο Έλληνας πολίτης τι ακριβώς συμβαίνει. Τώρα ακούμε από πρώτο χέρι ποιες είναι οι απόψεις της Ουάσιγκτον, ας τις ακούσουν οι πολίτες και ας βγάλουν ο καθένας τα δικά του συμπεράσματα. Εγώ σε ευχαριστώ πολύ που ήρθε στο φτωχικό μας. Χάρηκα για τη γνωριμία και εύχομαι πραγματικά να σε δούμε όσο πιο ψηλά γίνεται στην Ουάσιγκτον. Πόσο, πόσο ψηλά. Σα ευχαριστώ ξανά για αυτή την ευκαιρία και θα χαρώ στο μέλλον να συνεχίσουμε αυτήν την πολύ χρήσιμη συζήτηση. Ευχαριστώ. Ευχαριστώ πολύ.